Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Processing Raw Text. Now we're going to go on to part two, which is tokenization. Tokenization is when you work on breaking down long strings into smaller strings. Sometimes these smaller string parts are called constituents. It's kind of a weird word. It's very um, political to me, but what we mean is there are pieces of a larger part. So hence the, hence the name. And so a constituent of a sentence might be a phrase or it might be a word. Constituent of a discourse or a corpora might be an entire text. So the word is loosely used um, to mean words. Generally people think constituents are words, but that's not um, actually accurate. But here we're going to talk about both sentence tokenization and word tokenization because those are two levels we're actively interested in. Okay. So generally we're breaking down text into individual words, but you might be interested in more paragraphs or sentence-based text. And remember that tokens, when I use the word token here, it's an individual unit of meaning and unique tokens are called types. Okay. We're mostly going to use the word token because token here means the unit of meaning. However, unit of meaning might be a sentence. In our case, we're mostly going to focus on words, but let's look at sentence tokenization as well. All right, let's start there. So sometimes this is called sentence segmentation instead because people like tokenization to mean words so much that we come up with a different name. But the basic technique in most Latin-based languages is to break things down based on the period, the exclamation point, or a hard line return character. Let me zoom out just a little bit. <clears throat> okay. So slash n means new line. Okay. Um, to do this, we're going to use the tokenizers library in R. And I have um, my clean text that I pulled from the web in the last video, which is a whole lot of, of me writing a blog about um, web scraping, which I'm sure is way out of date now. But anyways, there's a blog on web scraping. And what I want to do is do tokenized sentences on my clean text, and it will give me a list back in R. Because you may be tokenizing many text pieces. So let's say you had 15 texts, you would get back a list of the sentences in each of those texts. So list format makes some sense. But since we only have one text, I just used unlist here. You wouldn't want to do that if you wanted to keep it with its um, mate, so to speak, its original discourse. Uh, here, we just have one large chunk of text we're looking at. So we are, are unlisting it just to, to count better. And then here, I just printed out some examples. I saved it as a list of sentences, but I just printed out just an example of um, a couple of the sentences. So let's see how well it did. So you can only do 5,000 characters at a time with Google Translate, um, Rvest, et cetera. Happy to hear comments. First load Rvest and R Selenium. Okay, so that looks pretty good. It went all straight to heck um, when we got to some code sections here. Okay. So, all right, count sentences on my clean text. Okay. Well, it told me if I counted sentences, it told me there were 99 sentences. Mm, it seems kind of like a lot. The blog is not very long. If I use tokenized sentences again, I, I, I made it two different objects here. I'm not sure why, but um, if I use tokenized sentences and use the link on the length of that, so how many of them are there? It says there's 22. Hmm. So right here, I really want to highlight some of the problems that we might see is that there are each package and even within the same package, this is all the tokenizers package, you're going to get different answers. And so this is why it's so critically important for people to show their code or to cite what code they're using um, so that you know which one it is. So I would say that the count sentences is a little high and maybe the tokenized sentences has missed some of the code sections here that are in this blog and the reality is somewhere in the middle. Okay. So let me try this in Python. NLTK is a very good package that unfortunately has been kind of abandoned to space and time, but it is still functional and it um, will do many tasks for us and sentence tokenization is one of them. 
it's kind of the OG Python package for processing. Okay. And so the default is what's called the punct sentence tokenizer. This is a pre-trained machine learning model, right? To find abbreviations, collocations, and sentence boundaries. So um, collocations are word combinations and sentence boundaries, question marks, periods, that kind of stuff. And it mostly works pretty well for Latin based languages, like, like uh, English and European languages, which is a broad swath of things. <laughs> Feels weird to write European languages as if there's like four, there's you know many, but um, this not work so well on, on any kind of iconographic or logographic language, okay, like Japanese. So we would import NLTK. Okay. We would say break down the sentences. So NLTK dot sentence tokenize, and we put in our sentences. And remember last time how I said that mostly R and Python do things backwards. It's tokenize sentences in R and sentence tokenize in Python. It's so annoying, <laughs> but just when you type the wrong one and you get blank is not defined, um, you've probably mixed them up from experience. So I told it to print sentences number one up to, but not including three. Don't forget our slicing rules. So this will print two sentences for me. And it's actually the second and third sentence because of our zero indexing laws. And let's see how many sentences there are. There's 32. That seems a bit more right to me. So I think the R version of this is slightly underestimating. The count sentences option in the tokenizers library is way overestimating. And Python here is probably very close to the truth without actually counting it myself. Because then the question becomes, what do all those R code sections count as, one sentence or multiples? Now, I could also use regular expressions to tokenize sentences, because regular expressions is how we kind of started this game of understanding um, sentence tokenization, part of speech tagging, and more. Um, but I would only suggest going this route if you have very difficult text to process that is in a very strange format, because it is a pain in the butt to write code that covers all of the different possibilities for regular expressions. It's much easier to use the pre-trained models. You could also take a pre-trained model and supplement it with regular expressions. So that's probably where I'd land is, do the pre-trained model unless it just totally doesn't give you anything useful, and then supplement any other things you need to clean up using the regular expression options. Okay. I hate it so much, I'm not even going to show you the example from the book, <laughs> because it is um, not really any better than the pre-trained models. All right, let's look at word tokenization. So it's probably one of the most important components when it taught when it comes to um, natural language processing work, because many of the analyses that we are interested in performing, like sentiment or opinion mining, is at the level of the word. So many analyses um, require you to to put in discourse or large bodies of text, but sometimes they want the word level. So one of the <laughs> to me one of the tricky parts about text cleaning is knowing which one the function wants. Can the function handle the entire string or does the function need me to break it down for it? So we'll use word tokenization quite a bit. And it feels like this should be easy, right? As an English speaker, the, the, it's just white space, right? It's actually not that easy. So don't forget about contractions or spelling errors that we have to deal with and logographic iconographic languages. So, it is not that easy in Chinese <laughs> because each character is sometimes more than one idea of a word. If I translate it back into English, it's more than one word, right? Um, which is not the best way to think about that. But most Chinese speakers will probably tell you that this is like a combination of concepts. So I have to determine if my level of analysis is at the character level as a concept, or if I'm gonna break those down into their component parts to get into more meaning levels as, as a word. I use the word word here pretty loosely, tokens. Okay, so what level do you want the token at? And so, um, you know, languages that use this traditional Latin alphabet that you're seeing on the screen are rather easy to process, but once you get into other languages that don't use spaces as key indicators, it becomes more complex. 
There's nothing wrong with those languages. This is more complex. So to do this in R, we're still using the tokenizers package. It's tokenized words. And we actually get a lot of cleaning up the text options here, which I find quite nice. Um, but we're breaking this down one idea at a time. So we're mostly gonna not use them. Okay. And so we'll say lowercase at all to make, make that true. I would have lowercase this much earlier in my processing, but it's another place you can do this. Stop words, okay. Do you want to remove the stop words or not? Here we're saying null, we leave them alone. Okay, more on stop words later. Do you want to strip the punctuation or not? So I'm gonna say true, take out the punctuation. You don't have to, you can leave it in. Do you wanna strip the numbers out or not? Okay, I left them in. And then simplify, this puts it in list format. Okay, so I left it as list format by saying false, if you do simplify, I believe it returns us like one big ver character vector. <clears throat> now this is printing out, okay? So it shows me all of my tokens. Remember I said in the last video, if it prints, it's not saving. So I haven't done anything to my original clean text. I have just printed this out. But if I wanted to use this word part in another analysis, don't forget you gotta save it. So you'd say cl clean tokens, oops, I'm sorry. Thank you, magic mouse. Clean tokens equals co tokenized words. Well, we can kind of quickly see that it m m maps pretty well onto what I would think most of the tokens should be. Okay. And it leaves together contractions. Okay, well, let's see what happens next. So to do this in, in uh, Python, we can use the NLTK library again, and the function is word tokenize. There's actually a couple of other ones. There's the tree bank tokenizer, which is a slightly different form, the talk talk tokenizer, and the default is the punct tokenizer. Okay. We can also do a regular expression tokenizer, which I really don't recommend unless you have very special text that you're interested in. And we could then also use spacey. We will use spacey too quite a bit in this in this um, set of lectures. Spacey three, I have not figured out. It's like some other person from Mars wrote it and I feel like it's completely different. So we're gonna use Spacey two, 2.2.3 um, specifically in this lecture set because that is something that I can teach you how to work. <laughs> um, Spacey three is fairly recent as of the recording of this video. And so I'm um, working on updating, but I don't get it. So <laughs> I'll be real honest, I don't get it. So um, Spacey 3 to be announced later. All right, that being said, this, and that happened in a semester that Jensen also updated. So it's been kind of like a wild time, but let's look at world tokenization, word tokenization and an LTK, okay. So word tokenize is a special function that is the pen tree bank tokenizer. I lied to you, it's pen tree bank and not punct. Punct is the sentence tokenizer. It's a regular expression monster. And so effectively what it does is it looks for a certain set of rules in a certain order to break sentences down. Okay. I was into words. It focuses on periods separates commas and single quotes when combined with a white space and not um, a quote for a contraction. Punctuation is included as a separate token. We excluded it a minute ago. And it deals with contractions in a sort of kind of way. And so we would do this. We'd say NLTK dot word tokenize, put in our clean text. Now I've saved this as words. Okay, and then I told it to print. So I printed some of these words. So we hung on to the punctuation. We could also tell it to not. Okay. Um, well, it's not, the default is to keep it in. We could tell it, we could strip it out later. Okay, using some regular expressions. And it looks pretty good, right? This is a well-known problem. Word tokenization is a well-solved problem in Latin-based languages. So use the defaults. Now, Spacey, on the other hand, is a very cool package, but installing it sometimes is the worst part. So you install Spacey like you do any other Python package. If you're using Miniconda, there's actually a, um, a special um, Spacey R package if you want to do this in R. 
but I'm gonna teach you the Python version. It's very similar. So you could install this. Um, in Miniconda, you have to use space ER to install it in the right place. If you're using regular Python, you do your traditional Python spacey installs. And then you also have to install a, a, a language model. So the thing about Spacey is it is a set of language models that do many NLP tasks. Okay. It is not the most expansive set of language models that would belong to UDPipe and R, which is also a great package um, that does tokenization. I like it more than word tokenize or tokenize words, um, actually. And we'll talk about UDPipe in a little bit, but I find installing Spacey is usually the tricky part. Okay. So be sure you install both Spacey and the language model. And the one I'd recommend is the English small model because it runs really well. Okay. And the small versus the medium versus the large is just how big the model is, how many words it's been run on, I believe. So it's more complex, the larger it is. For our purposes, small is gonna work real well. Now, if you look at any of the documentation, they tell you to import Spacey, load the language model as NLP. Okay, so Spacey.load and then the language model. Okay. And then what you do is you just apply or you just run your text through that language model. Okay, so you say NLP on the text. Very cool. And now this Spacey process has a ton of stuff. It has part of speech text, it has lemmas, it has dependency parsing, it has like an unbelievable amount of things in English. Okay. So let's just have it tell us about sentences since I didn't show you this a minute ago. So spacey processed dot sense means print the sentences out. All right, pretty cool, pretty cool. How many did it give me? 76. So we have a range of numbers from 22 to 99. And that is really what I really want you to get. Like each package will give you something slightly different and you have to decide for yourself which one best suits your needs. And so one thing students love to ask me um, is which one is best? What's the best way to do this? And I'm like, I don't know, what are you doing? <laughs> because there is no one best answer. What language are you better at? What language are you more comfortable in? Do you want to mix and match? Because I've gotten to the point now where I'm comfortable enough that I know that this is better in R and this is better in Python and now I can do both. Um, what's the goal of the task? How fast do you need it to run? So there is no answer to which one is the best. Maybe once in a while there is, but generally there's no answer. There's which one works for your task at that moment. Okay. And so which one do I believe? I probably believe in LTKs, which was in the thirties or forties, cause it's not a very long block, okay, but they all do process differently. Now, how do I get the words back? Well, that one's a little harder. So we're gonna introduce the concept of loops in Python. So people in R are like anti-loop. I don't understand. I grew up in Perl, so like I love loops. I don't know, loop for days. But people in R are like, bad loops. Right? Use apply, I'm like apply is a fancy form of loop, but okay, whatever. So Python people love loops. I have found my people, right? So Py the Python, you will see a lot of loop commands. And they're written in a way that's meant to be readable as a sentence. So they're often formatted on a single line. Okay. Not all loop commands are formatted on a single line. That is not a requirement. Um, I've got an example here of one that's not on a single line. Uh, so whichever way you like it better. I'm gonna do a little bit of both. So the way you read them is it's the thing I want back looping over this stuff. I always start reading them at where the four is because this is how I learned it. So for each word, this is a made up variable name for words in spacey process. This is something that needs to be iterable, meaning I can loop over it. So it's got to have more than one thing. It's got to be a certain type of object. So for each word in spacey process, give me back. So I think it would have been better for a word in give or something, but mm, okay. it's this. Give me this thing back for each word in spacey process. Well, this thing here is dot text. Dot text gives you the raw word back in spacey. I told it to only print the first 500. Okay, zero up to, but not including 500. 
So give me each word back for all the words in spacey process. So you can look at how this goes. It is saving the slash ends as their own words because they're enter keys. It does separate out <clears throat> anything with a period. So the code gets kind of worked up funny, but that's true in the other packages as well. Here's another way that I could have done this. Um, I could have saved this as a separate list. So this kind of spacey format's a little awkward. So if I wanted to stick it into a separate list of my own, I could start one. So saved list. Okay, see so for each word in spacey process, print it out and stick it into a um, separate list for me. Okay, so dot append adds it to the list. Now, another thing to notice is that Python is very particular about spacing. R is like loose and fast with spacing. It's like we hit the space bar three times, it ignores it. Python does not. Right? So if you're going to do a loop in Python with multiple lines or define a function in Python, which we'll do in a little bit, what you do is you have your first line, colon, you hit enter and tab over. So you can hit the space bar five times, or you can actually hit the literal tab key. And these tabs have got to exist. When you want to go out of the loop, be sure you put a blank line and then tab it back over. Now we'll show you something, um, maybe not in this example, but um, one thing that can be problematic in Python is when you are using Markdown and Python together. So I'm gonna just make a quick blank Markdown and import a Python chunk. And let's say, what have we got here? Okay, or not. What have I, what have I got in R? Oh, there it goes, it's just really slow. Let's see, on uh, my R library, what do I have open? I have blog post open still, or clean text. So let's import this. I think it's open. Yeah, okay, it's open. Cool. Um, anytime you wanted to like loop over something. Okay, let's say four letter in clean text. I just want to, now when I hit enter there, it automatically tabbed over. So that's really good. Um, what do I want to do? I can print the letter. Now, when I hit control enter, in Python, it doesn't quite interpolate this as nice as I would like, because when you're hitting enter, normally it transfers over to the console and it runs, right? This is what we're used to in R. However, in Python, it like stops. And so you have to have this extra space here to help it understand that you are done. So let me hit escape over here. Let me try running this again. So it runs one line at a time and it just doesn't realize that you're done over here in the console. If you hit enter, in the console, it's like, oh, you were done. Okay. And so often I find that students have problems, and myself, have problems when we're writing loops or, or defining functions with, with the Python chunks. And so my recommendation is always leave a blank line after a loop is over. Oh, let's turn again. Because then it will often kind of figure it out, but you have to run both the loop and the line underneath it, which is not optimal. The other thing you can do is use this run all button. Okay. And that will run it in the chunk and it works a lot better, the run all button. So two key facets, leave a blank line. Okay. And if it's still acting kind of funky and telling you that you're doing it quite wrong, um, hit the run all button and make sure it runs over here in the Python console. Okay, so it's just some tips from working with RStudio for a while. All right. Now, in our next section, what we're gonna cover is how to remove symbols. So this one's a little short to, to kind of keep these from being super long. Um, we're gonna talk about removing symbols. And then in part four, we're gonna kind of try to tie all this stuff together. So see you back here for removing symbols. I think it's spell checking and contractions.